Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is um, Anthony Painter. I'm director of the Action and Research Centre here at the RSA. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening for this special event. Um, just before we get started, a quick reminder that we are filming uh, tonight's event and live streaming on the web, so welcome to everyone joining us online. Uh, for those of you here in the room, please do switch your phones to silent. Um, no need to turn them off completely, because um, you may all want to tweet your thoughts throughout the session and join the online conversation via the hashtag um, RSA Economy. Now, um, as some of you will be aware, um, today we kick off a special season of events to celebrate the opening of the RSA's new Enlightenment coffee house, Rathmals, um, a space that we hope will open up a new chapter in the RSA's rich history as a home for all those who want to share ideas and work together to make positive social change a practical reality. Uh, across our season, we're going to be hearing from change makers and creative minds on the big social, political, economic challenges that we're currently facing now. And in a decade ahead, um, and we hope giving us some grounds to optimism amidst what can feel like pretty dark and anxious times. Um, one of the key uh, themes of our series and an important strand of our research program here at the RSA is how to tackle inequality. Um, and build an economy that works for everyone, a democratic economy. And on that subject, uh, we really couldn't have a more fitting speaker than our guest this evening, Ted Howard. Ted is the co-founder and president of the Democracy Collaborative, which is an action-oriented progressive think tank established 20 years ago in the United States. Um, Ted has been named one of the 25 visionaries who are changing your world. And he is leading light and spokesperson. <laughs> An honour indeed. <laughs> He's leading light and spokesperson for the community wealth building movement internationally. And he previously served as the executive director of the National Centre for Economic Alternatives and as a senior fellow for social justice at the Cleveland Foundation, where he led a team that developed the comprehensive job creation and wealth building strategy that resulted in the Evergreen Cooperative uh, Initiative. Uh, Ted will talk more about that in his talk. The Evergreen Cooperatives, in, in turn, were an important inspiration for the community wealth building strategy now un underway in Preston in Lancashire. Um, as well as other cities uh, across the UK and increasingly across Europe, in fact. Um, in his speech for us this evening, Ted will share stories and lessons from this growing movement and show how it might help us make the shift towards a democratic political economy. He'll ask, how can we redesign our local economies from the community level up um, to the national um, to produce more equitable outcomes? Uh, this is a question that speaks directly to a number of action research projects that the RSA is currently involved in. We share the desire to walk to, uh, work towards a more democratic and equitable economy. Hopefully this shines through in the 10 foundations for 21st century enlightenment that we laid out last week, available online. Um, these foundations include mass ownership, fundamental devolution of power and resources, improving economic security through trying to get universal basic income, um, and seeking a new social contract around good work. So, I'm looking forward to the conversation with Ted following his opening speech and to hearing your thoughts too. Um, there'll be plenty of time for Q&A before we wrap up by 7 o'clock, so a packed hour ahead. So let's get started and give a warm welcome to Ted Howard. Thank you very much. It's very good to be here. I feel so tall here. <laughs> it's a long way down there. I'll try not to fall. Um, uh, th thank you very much, Anthony, for the kind introduction, and thank you for the invitation and opportunity to address the RSA and its friends. It's truly a privilege and an honor to be here with you. Uh, I just wanted to say that the leadership that the RSA has shown in recent years in its support for the kind of work that Anthony was laying out, uh, that, that he and his team are involved in, economic democracy, community banking, universal basic income, uh, local economies and more, it is truly an impressive portfolio of work that's deeply, deeply important in these challenging times. As Anthony indicated in his introduction, my topic today, the making of a democratic economy, speaks directly to the work that the RSA is undertaking. So in some ways I feel Anthony could be up here and I could be learning from him, but I was fortunate to get the invitation. In my remarks, uh, this evening, I shall argue that we are in a period in which the outlines of a new democratic economy are emerging, both in the United Kingdom 
and even in the United States. And those of you looking at politics in the United States may think that's a bit of a push to believe that, but I firmly do. It is my belief that beneath the surface of our current economies, ones in which we are experiencing ever-growing inequalities of wealth and income and a new age of monopoly capitalism, a new economy is being born. I hope to prove that assertion to you tonight. Before discussing the emerging new democratic opportunity in the economies of our countries, I would like to spend a few minutes on our current economic challenge due to what I would call the extractive economy. In my forthcoming book with my colleague Marjorie Kelly, some of you may know her work, she's just a brilliant thought leader in the United States, that, that book is entitled The Making of a Democratic Economy. We define the extractive economy as, quote, an economy designed to benefit the wealthy, to enable the financial elite to extract maximum gain for themselves in every possible way, everywhere on the globe, heedless of collateral damage created for workers, communities, and the environment. It's a strong indictment. We can see this extractive economy at work all around us, in the United States and here in the United Kingdom. The institutions and arrangements at the heart of our economic system, today's form of capitalism, concentrated private ownership, corporate dominance, the overweening might of Wall Street and city-based finance capital, together these form a powerful engine for the extraction of wealth and its distribution upwards, not trickling down. It is this basic design, I believe, that drives the outcomes we are seeing in terms of growing inequality, stagnant or falling wages, underinvestment, austerity in public budgets, the extraction of wealth from our communities, decreased social mobility, the looming threat of climate change. These are not aberrations. These are logical outcomes of the way our economy has been organized and is driving forward. Everywhere, wealth and power have not flown downwards to consumers and citizens, but upwards to economic elites, and crucially, to a very particular kind of elite. The new rulers of our world make their money not by producing goods and services that are useful to others, but by owning assets in an increasingly financialized economy. All of this means that the runaway success of today's elites is not part of a rising tide that lifts all boats, as the doc doctrine of trickle-down has so long claimed. Instead, it is achieved directly at the expense of ordinary working men and women and the communities in which they live. You're all aware of the unequal distribution of wealth in the United Kingdom, and you don't need me to uh, give you those statistics. But it was extraordinary to be here over this past week and hear the representative of the United Nations discuss his report on poverty in Britain and the impact that ongoing austerity is having on your population. This is not the Britain that I remember from some years past. But let me say a few words about this situation in the United States before I make a turn toward the positive and the democratic economy, which is really my topic. In the United States, the three wealthiest men in my country now own more wealth than the entire bottom half of the American population combined, a total of 160 million people. And this wealth chasm is rapidly widening. Since 2009, during the great uh, financial crisis, 95% of income gains in the U.S. have gone to the top 1%. An alarming 47% of my fellow citizens cannot put together $400 in the face of an emergency. They don't have access to that in their lives, leaving nearly half of my nation unprepared to face even ordinary mishaps, like a flat tire that needs to be repaired to get yourself to work, a broken water pipe in your home, or a child's twisted ankle. The percentage of American children living in poverty has remained the same as it was in the 1960s, but the raw number has grown, obviously, as the population has grown. And concentrated poverty has more than doubled since the year 2000. All told, nearly 50 million people in the United States live below the government-established poverty line in the most productive 
economy and the largest economy in the history of the world. So if we are serious about addressing the deep systemic challenges we are facing, I believe it is clear that merely tinkering around the edges of the extractive economy will not do. We need an altogether different set of economic institutions and arrangements capable of producing sustainable, lasting, and more democratic outcomes. In contrast to the extractive economy, what I see is an emerging alternative that I would call the democratic economy. The aim of this democratic economy isn't triumph for a few and passivity for the many, but economic empowerment of all, enduring empowerment through broad-based asset ownership. This is a new concept of social change, less about regulations and social safety nets and more about assets and institutions. It's about redesigning basic economic institutions and activities, companies, investments, economic development, employment, purchasing, banking, to serve the common good, and to serve the common good as the first core priority mission, not as an add-on after the fact. The exciting thing about the democratic economy is that it is not some theoretical construct nor a pipe dream, but already emerging all around us. A spontaneous response to social pain by people in some of our poorest communities and neighborhoods that have long suffered high levels of unemployment and deprivation. These solutions start where I believe all fundamental change begins, in communities and from the bottom up. This has been the case with large order, order change in both the UK and in my country. American historians who study the period of the Great Depression during the late 1920s and 1930s have used a term for what took place in America's community. They call it the laboratories of democracy. As the Depression took hold in America in 1929, the levels of pain across the country grew. But the ideology of the then federal government at the time, under Herbert Hoover, the president, was that the government should do nothing to address the growing depression, that the market would correct itself. And so in community after community, people took their fate into their own hands and began to address their problems themselves because no one was coming to save them. New approaches were, de were derived and devised that could eventually be lifted up and scaled. America's primary social safety net, you may know, is called the social security system. Everyone over a certain age, you know, 62, uh, receives a benefit from the government for the years that they worked. That social safety net, the most important in our country, did not come from the minds of wise men sitting in Washington, D.C. in the federal government. It began in small communities in Alaska, which was not even a state at that time, it was a province, and California, as people grappled with their challenges. When the politics changed nationally, when the Roosevelt administration came in and the New Deal began, these small models that were designed to, to support senior citizens in these communities of California and Alaska, these small models were lifted up into this comprehensive system of national support, the Social Security. Uh, system. Here in Britain, there's a similar experience you know well. When Bevan launched the NHS in 1948, he drew his inspiration from a community-based model in South Wales that began in 1890. This small Welsh experiment was scaled up into one of the great health systems of the world. So the question that I ask is, what are the equivalents today of these models and ideas that point to the outlines of a powerful new approach in our own time? one that can be taken and scaled such that it can touch everyone's lives. Does such a thing exist in our world? I'd argue that community wealth building, the very foundation of a democratic economy, is such an approach. And I'd like to now uh, sort of pivot my remarks to describe community wealth building and then uh, describe two places, one in England and one in the United States where it is taking place. Um, and happily, you're going to get to meet some of the people who are building one of these models in a two and a half minute video. Um, community wealth building is a local economic development strategy 
focused on building collaborative, inclusive, sustainable, and democratically controlled local economies. It has many different forms, institutional forms, that work together to build a wealth building initiative. These include worker cooperatives, community land trusts, community development finance institutions, anchor institution investment, hiring, and procurement strategies that are localized to community, municipal and local public enterprise, and increasingly, public banking. Community wealth building is economic system change, but starting at the local level. The term first emerged in the United States in 2005 and was coined by colleagues at my own organization, the Democracy Collaborative. We've identified a number of core design principles that are embraced by a community wealth building strategy, and let me just give you three or four. I won't go through the whole list. First, the priority of labor over capital, particularly in a time of crisis, with continued stable employment more important than capital's profits. So labor in first place over capital. Not that capital is not important, but it doesn't drive every decision that's being made in order to maximize shareholder value. Second, the need for local and broad-based rather than absentee ownership as the basis for asserting what interests are to be valued in our community. Local ownership broadly held rather than absentee ownership. The importance of active democratic ownership contrasted with the passive consumer model we live with now. I think democracy is a very good thing. I'd like to see more of it in our workplaces where we can be trained on a daily basis in the arts of democracy as strong democratic citizens. And I would suggest the central role for multipliers and internalizing the circulation of money in our communities with investment sticking rather than capital being extracted. I live in a very poor neighborhood in Cleveland, Ohio. And yet even in that neighborhood where 40% of the residents live below the poverty line, there are still financial resources. The problem is they keep getting drained out of our community. How do we get them circulating to get a multiplier effect to put more people to work? And finally, at the heart of community wealth building is a systemic change approach. Moving beyond projects and programs, individual little things, to create an entire ecosystem of institutions and policies that can produce reliably beneficial outcomes as a natural consequence of the working of the new local system. Thus, the fundamental goal of community wealth building is to rebuild the very basis of a local economy from the ground up on principles of equity, inclusion, democracy, and resilience. At the Democracy Collaborative, we've been tracking and promoting the growth of innovations in community wealth buildings, which I'm going to tell you about now, uh, for almost two decades. I well remember I remembered this morning again, when we coined the term community wealth building nearly 15 years ago, I conducted a Google search at that time, or whatever was the search engine, I don't know if Google's 15 years old even. Um, I conducted a search online and found no references at all to the term community wealth building, zero. This morning as I prepared this lecture, I searched for the term and found 218 million results. Now, even allowing for massive duplication, this is an extraordinary development in just a decade and a half as a new paradigm of economic development is being born. So, let me give you a sense of how this expansion has started to happen in the United States. Take the example of community development finance institutions, which provide credit and financial services to people and communities underserved by mainstream commercial banks and lenders. The kind of people that can't go into a traditional bank and even get a loan. In the early 1990s, for the most part, community finance was more a concept than a reality in the United States with fewer than $2 billion in assets devoted to it. Today, the industry includes over 1,000 federally certified community development financial institutions whose combined assets as of 2015, the last time a study was done, 
are an estimated $121.6 billion, a 60-fold increase in the space of just two decades. Cooperative ownership in many forms, from producer to purchasing and financial cooperatives, is ascendant in the United States. Over 100 million Americans belong to various types of cooperatives, including credit unions, which have around 111 million members and manage $1.3 trillion in assets. That's more than Wall Street giant Goldman Sachs has under management. There are various other forms of employee ownership, such as the peculiar American form of employee stock ownership plans. Today, more than 10 million Americans work in companies they own in whole or in part through these what are called ESOP plans. And with the retirement of the baby boom generation, which is being called the silver tsunami because of hair like mine, a major new opportunity exists to dramatically expand, expand employee ownership as a succession planning strategy for current owners if their family doesn't want the company. Who, where will the company go? Well, it can be sold to the workers for a very advantageous uh, tax rate for the current owner. In fact, at the Democracy Collaborative, we have started a campaign called 50 by 50. The idea uh, is to expand employee ownership in America from the current level of 10 million to 50 million people by the year 2050. That would represent about one-third of the entire U.S. workforce. In cities like Richmond, Virginia and Rochester, New York, the mayors have started offices of community wealth building intended to promote just these kinds of strategies. New York City is now supporting a comprehensive strategy and has a budget line item in their uh, budget to build worker co-ops in marginalized communities. Beyond this, city governments are uh, uh, owning municipal enterprises, uh, building broadband networks that traditional corporations won't come in and build because they don't see enough profit. So the city government is creating this asset for the community. Publicly owned utilities, together with cooperative utilities, currently provide a quarter of America's electricity, including in Nebraska, a very politically conservative state, but also an all public power state in which every resident and business gets electricity from one of 166 community owned and based entities in one of the most conservative, reddest, pro-Trump states in the United States. Everybody is getting their energy from publicly owned community wealth type utilities. So I could go on and on about all this, but there are tremendous opportunities. Uh, hospitals, universities, cultural centers in America reorienting their, their procurement, their investment policies to benefit their local communities. Huge potential. If you just take all the universities and hospitals in America on an annual basis, they represent over $1.2 trillion of economic activity rooted and anchored in communities that can be leveraged for the benefit of communities and married with the community wealth strategies that I've been sharing with you. So, and by the way, uh, as one of my colleagues uh, likes to put it, uh, a Brit who lives in Washington, D.C. and works in our office, uh, you, uh, the United Kingdom is home to the mother of all anchor institutions, the National Health Service. Um, we are working, by the way, my organization, with your Health Foundation, based here in London, and the Manchester-based Center for Local Economic Strategies to explore how your NHS might better leverage their own hospitals, clinics, and other assets to improve the economy and thus the health of local communities. So I'd like to focus in my remaining few minutes on two examples of two communities, one in your country, one in mine, where community wealth strategies are being implemented at scale. Many of you will be familiar with the Preston model in Lancashire. It has been widely reported in The Guardian, in The Times, in The Economist, on the BBC. There, with the leadership of the city council, a coalition of local anchor institutions, uh, housing authorities, the University of Central Lancashire, the uh, Lancashire Con Police Constabulary and others have begun to refocus their purchasing, hiring, and investment policies around a community wealth strategy. Within a few short years, this didn't begin until 2012, 
Within a few short years, Preston has become a model for how local economies in the UK, even in this age of government austerity, can generate their own wealth and economic opportunity. Public service spending in the time of austerity has gone up in Preston by more than 70 million pounds as contracts have been repatriated that formerly went to large multinational vendors. Contracts are now going back to vendors of businesses based in Preston itself. 70 million pounds. Lancashire itself has seen an influx of 200 million pounds into this strategy and as a result more than a thousand local jobs have either been created or saved and sustained in a city that was frankly back in 2010-11 was flat on its back as a result of the financial crisis. In a recent study, Preston, once designated as one of the most deprived cities in the Northwest, was named the most improved community in the entire United Kingdom. New elements of the strategy are now under development. The creation of worker cooperatives to fill gaps in the local markets. Uh, a municipal clean energy company, the creation of a public bank of Lancashire, all in this small town of about 140,000 people in an area that has been so hard hit by the uh, deindustrialization. Now some 40 communities across England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland have reached out to Preston to learn from their experiences and begin to build their own community wealth strategies. Preston, to my mind, is the most interesting system change model of community wealth building exists anywhere in the world, at least that I've seen. So congratulations to you all for that. I'd like to conclude with some uh, words about where I live, Cleveland, Ohio. Um, Cleveland is an older industrial city in the United States. It's on Lake Erie. Um, it's in what's called the Midwest. It's a city where industry was once the basis of a thriving economy. It's a city that John D. Rockefeller uh, uh, lived in and helped build. It's the place he located Standard Oil's headquarters, a city that in its heyday had more Fortune 500 companies headquartered in Cleveland, Ohio, than any city in the United States except New York City. There are about two left. Steel workers in Cleveland at one point, highly organized by unions, once made the highest hourly wages in the entire nation of the United States. In more recent years, Cleveland became a city devastated by deindustrialization and the flight of jobs and capital. Once Cleveland had been one of the five wealthiest cities in America, today it is ranked as the second or third poorest. It's hard to convey the full magnitude of the economic destruction visited upon places like Cleveland all across what was once America's manufacturing heartland. Cleveland alone has lost more than half a million people of its population since 1950. 57% of the population gone. It's as if half the city has been thrown away at tremendous human capital and carbon costs. The disparities are, are dark. Uh, in this a community of Glenville, where I've lived the last few years, it's a neighborhood within Cleveland. It's a, a neighborhood that's uh, uh, almost 100% African American. The average life expectancy for a male in my neighborhood, who, who would be black, is 64 years. Directly east, eight miles in a suburb, a white suburb of Cleveland, the average life expectancy of a male who's white is 88 years. 24 years of life expectancy directly correlated to issues of poverty and wealth inequality and income. So about a decade ago, leaders of the Cleveland Foundation and the Cleveland community decided they needed a new approach to rebuild the, the economic basis of, of the city. And what they realized is while the city may be poor, it has a legacy of its former manufacturing strength. Large institutions like the Cleveland Clinic, which is one of the five largest employers in the entire uh, state of Ohio, and very big universities like Case Western Reserve University and so forth. And so they designed a strategy to leverage the purchasing, investment, and hiring policy of these institutions. Just three of them together have on an annual basis $6 billion in economic activity, and yet surrounded by neighborhoods with 50,000 residents, who 40% of whom live below the poverty line. So the goal was uh, it, it, simple. How do we break down the barrier between the world-class institutions and the neighborhoods and get the money flowing into the neighborhoods. And so we focused at the beginning on 
procurement, driving contracts locally. And what we've created is now known as the Evergreen Cooperatives. It's a network of for-profit businesses hiring people locally from the community, many of whom are ex-offenders, have police records, can't get jobs in many other uh, businesses, um, and root the companies in the neighborhoods and uh, capture contracts from the institutions. So far, this network has three cooperative worker-owned businesses in it, 250, 300 people are employed currently, living wage jobs, benefits, housing programs, uh, opportunities to progress, and uh, profit sharing as the companies are profitable. Uh, many hundreds of other jobs, not cooperative worker ownership jobs, but good, decent living wage jobs have been created through this strategy as well. And because the Evergreen Cooperatives are democratically owned businesses, the wealth is created and rooted in the company, in the community. So the idea is not just to benefit the workers, but to benefit the community as well. Very quickly, this is um, what Cleveland looks like. That's the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And that's the football stadium where our team loses almost every game. Uh, and that's Lake Erie. Uh, and this is from t the Toronto Star, did an article about, you know, what's happening in this Rust Belt city of Cleveland. So just, uh, I talked about uh, putting together an ecosystem that could produce these results on an ongoing basis. This is part of our ecosystem. You can see they're worker-owned firms. They're hiring from the community. There's a community foundation is providing some finance, as is the municipal government. There's a technical assistance and financing arm that, get, that is incubating new businesses and providing back office services to the institutions. We have three companies. This is the uh, Green City Growers. We're growing three million heads of lettuce in downtown Cleveland and 300,000 pounds of basil, year-round hydroponic food production, and cutting out, uh, out 1,500 miles of carbon-based transportation because the growing season in Cleveland is so short we're buying all of our lettuce from Mexico and California and Arizona. Not any longer. It's being grown right downtown. We have a commercial laundry service. We have now just been awarded the contract for the Cleveland Clinic. Over 20 million pounds of healthcare bed linen being produced by this company every year. By the way, they just had a profit sharing event at the beginning of the year. For the workers that have been there the longest, they receive checks, bonuses of over $5,000 US each which in a neighborhood where the median household income is $18,000 can be a life-altering amount of money. Uh, again, here's our food production greenhouse. This is our crew. We have a renewable energy and green construction company. So what I'd like to do now is take two minutes as I conclude and introduce you to some of the people that are making Evergreen work. I've been at Evergreen eight years, and I've done just about every job here. We supply linen for hospitals and nursing homes and hotels, and supply jobs for the neighborhood. We're on time, on track. We work together as a whole team. Now we all set, ready to go. Our mission of Evergreen Cooperative Laundry is to serve our customers and to give a better life to our employees. I thought life was was bought over for me, you know, and then this job came along and it's been wonderful ever since. We like to hire those people that would ordinarily not have an opportunity to find a job. I made a mistake, but I really wanted someone to give me a second chance because I know that I had worked hard during my incarceration to become a different woman coming out than I was going in. We also do home ownership through payroll deduction. You know, we do share in the profits. Our mission is to create the wealth, but also to stabilize our communities. This marks probably one of the best days in our nine-year history. We formally announced today our, our partnership with the Cleveland Clinic to take over operations here at their Column and Yards facility. We had to find a new partner in our laundry plant. We knew that once we gave Evergreen an opportunity to come in and run the plant, they would have a vested interest because it's a job that they are part owners. So we felt like once we got them in here, they would do a wonderful job. I was excited. The Cleveland Clinic's a world premier organization, and that makes us a world premier organization. It really speaks to the Cleveland Clinic's commitment to our community. Just within the last few months, we've added over 100 new jobs. We always want to be able to do something bigger, and, and with Cleveland Clinic partnering with us, we're able to be a part of something that 
affects so many people. Working here gives me a different perspective of life, you know, because life is good and there's an uh, opportunity for everyone at Evergreen to achieve. They give them hope, they help them buy homes, they become part owner. How could you not want to support that? My life has changed a lot um, in the past almost two years now. I look forward to getting up and coming to work every morning here. They're part of an organization that's going to help them also create their wealth and to take care of their families. It stabilized my life. I bought a house, I'm able to provide for my wife and family. It's done a lot for me. Being an owner makes me feel proud. It makes me feel like I've worked to accomplish something instead of just being stagnant. I want to flourish and I want everybody to see me flourish. Because I want all these ladies and gentlemen here to flourish. And with Cleveland Clinic partnering with us, that's exactly what we're doing. So the people you saw that are working in that facility, they're not just employees, they're actual owners. Each person has a share, an equal share of the company and each person considers themselves an owner of the business in which they are working. So I, I'll end with just this quote. Albert Einstein, you all know, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. Community wealth building is an approach that's fundamentally different than how we've built our economies in our countries to date. It is asset-based, it's ownership-based, it is intentionally in endeavoring to be inclusive. It is for profit, but it is profit linked to the benefit of the community itself. And it's intended to give people a chance to become the strong democratic citizens that certainly our countries need now more than ever. So thank you very much for your, your time and how such a attentive audience. And I think we're going to have a few questions from Anthony. Thank you very much. I've long been a fan and, uh, and, and hearing the whole story and, and seeing that testimony um, only underpins and un underlines that. I just want to ask you a question first of all about, about the strategy. I mean, this is a 20 year story if not more, considerably yeah. more. Um, and what has been most interesting about this from, from my perspective is you sort of note the injustices. Um, you talk about the grotesque divides of wealth, inequality, and so on. But you very quickly pivot to change and investment and strategies and building and finding solutions. Um, don't you want to take on the big guys? Um, a bit more um, beyond that is the risk that community wealth build building ends up as quite marginal um, and actually the enormous concentrations of wealth and power that we're seeing in a sort of winner takes all economy gets left unaddressed. Yeah, so um, the, the way I see what we're trying to do is uh, really consistent with that first that idea of laboratories of democracy. We need to learn how to do this and, and let me say I think that video shows a kind of inspiring example. You know, it kind of turns me on. Uh, we have made every single mistake in the books you can possibly make. It is a miracle that these companies are still standing. So, and, and to this day, so I don't want to, uh, you know, gloss it over too much. Um, but we need to learn how to build this form of economic development. And so this laboratory of democracy piece is very important. At the same time, the transformation of the kind of capitalism we have into a next system is not simply going to come out of the level of community. Mm -hmm. We have also got to be working at the very large order of the financialization of our system, the political and so forth. So at the Democracy Collaborative, we, we are really organized in two ways. There's the on the ground work to learn how to do this kind of community based economic development, and we have something that you're aware of that we call the Next System Project mm -hmm. that is really looking at, in a sense, kind of the question, if you don't like state socialism, I don't think a lot of us like what happened there, and you don't really like much ca corporate capitalism, what kind of system can you envision for the future? How would trade be managed? How would banks work? What about industry? So I think we need to be working at both levels. 
Um, and then hopefully, as, as I believe, if, when the politics do change, there's an opening for some local ideas to move to a very high level. And do you think the, the stories of the growing concentration of wealth and the increasing engagement with community wealth building strategies are connected in some, in some way? That these laboratories of democracies, as, as you describe them, are a, a necessary response to a vacuum that communities are facing. That you know, even without extraordinary leadership, there is, there is a thirst and desire to do something differently, and that's what you're, you've been able to tap into. Or are they two separate stories? No, I think they're very much the same story. First of all, I am going to start to say laboratories. Enough of this American laboratories. <laughs> uh, but but uh, I think they're very much uh, uh, interlinked because at least in the United States, I'm coming to know your communities. I was in Mansfield uh, uh, in the Midlands uh, recently, and, and I was in the, two months ago in Pudsey, and I've been to Manchester and you know Preston many times. But at least in the U.S. context, um, there has uh, a recognition has come about that the old way of doing things is just not, you know, producing the results that we want. And so, there is, and including in very conservative and red. You know, our red is conservative in the United States. Your red is pretty left. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, there's a willingness to uh, innovate and, and build that uh, there was not even 10 years ago. The, this crisis is forcing people to get outside of what they feel comfortable with and take some real risks. And, and again, in conservative and liberal communities. And you ended the, your, your talk with a, an apposite quote from Albert Einstein uh, around um, the incapability of building tomorrow, the ideas of today. But do you sense that there's a barrier that in trying to build the economy of tomorrow with the economy of today? And I'm, I'm particularly thinking around, and you, you mentioned the stat around access to ready cash and savings and linking into a story of economic insecurity. And the risk is actually, it becomes an, an insurmountable barrier that the, deg the degree and depth of economic insecurity means wherever, wherever it flourishes, there nonetheless is a, is a barrier to it, to it spreading. Just because people don't have the time or mental space or assets or resources to go through the training program that democracy mm. requires in a metaphorical sense. Yeah. Well, that's why... I mean, I appreciate what you're, you're pointing at, and it's why this is, this is not a solution that's short-term and a silver bullet. It's a, my colleague and co-founder of the Democracy Collaborative says, if you want to play this game, if you really want to rebuild the basis of a country, the, the, the kind of chip in to play is decades of your life on the table. And the way we see it is if you look at, it is true that there is this massive concentration of wealth and power. It is also true that there are extraordinary trends that this concentration has not been able to halt, whether it's wealth inequality or climate change or many other things. And so our theory of change, if you will, is that within this large order economy, we think it is going to be increasingly pressed to produce results and that the strategy is what we call evolutionary reconstruction, is start to build inside the economy th the basis for the next economic model. And it may take 20 or 30 years. I won't be around to see it, but hopefully um, what we're trying to do is make an alternative, an idea whose time has come. And of course, Victor Hugo said, all the armies of the world cannot stop the inexorable advance of an idea whose time has come. That's what we're trying to do. And what do you say to critics, probably of a neoliberal um, um, bent, who, who describe this as a sort of you know, local protectionism, and someone's got to pay the price of these, these strategies. It might be local taxpayers, um, local service users, mm -hmm. it might be workers in other communities who are not able to compete for, these, for these, these contracts. Some might say it's a beggar thy neighbor approach. What's your answer to, yeah. to, to critics? Because that's the one I've heard as being yeah. a common critique of right. this. Well, we've heard it a lot. So we're actually <laughs> producing a very uh, meaty and deep paper on this that we hope we can put on the table and handle. I was amused in a, uh, a piece on, um, it was a BBC piece, I think, on uh, Preston 
and they trotted out as some economists from one of your more conservative think tanks who said this is nothing different than what Donald Trump is doing with his sort of fortress America. And so I, I thought that was uh, pretty amusing. You know, <laughs> I think, um, uh, so I, I do not see this as now uh, uh, like every city at war with every other city. What we've seen in the United States is we've, if you take Preston, when they started their work of bringing some contracts back, uh, first, the contracts were not going to small businesses in local other communities, you know, in Lancashire. Uh, they were going to very large multinational firms, a number of them not even in this country. And when they started this, only 5% of their spending, of public spending in Preston, was going back into Preston at all. It was all leaking out. They've done extraordinary work, and I think it's up to 17%. So it's never going to be the case that it's going to move to 100% and that we're taking contracts from one another. The other thing that we found is, uh, you know, by uh, directing this money locally and then being able to achieve, for instance, a multiplier effect, the, the boost to the economy is just so extraordinary. Um, so, uh, you know, one could say, well, you're growing three million heads of lettuce and there's, uh, what about people in California that are growing that lettuce? But it's such a marginal little blip, and we've been able to put to get put 50 people to work with it, and it hasn't even been missed out there. That's brilliant. Thank you. Right, I'm going to open it out to uh, the audience. Um, I'm going to take this lady here first. I'm going to take this lady and this lady, and take three, banker three. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I just wondered, uh, how do you feel about maybe finding allies within? the corporate capitalism. You know that every system has um, insiders who would wish for better things. And the, some of the responses to the current crisis have been uh, of the sort, uh, you know, they would describe it as conscious capitalism or shared value mm -hmm. um, and things like that. Okay, yeah. great, thank you. And then let's go to this lady. Uh, yes, I was just wondering what your view is on, on banking generally in terms of banking supporting business, is the answer local sort of cooperative banks? Is there a role for big national banks any longer? Yeah, thank you. And then it was uh, this lady here. Yeah. Um, uh, I was just wondering whether there was any evidence to show that um, local economic strategies are more efficient than outsourcing contracts or not? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can take those in any order you want. Good. Where, where to find corporate allies, yep. um, banks, cooperative banks, and uh, the efficiency of local yep. economic strategies. So uh, I'll uh, take them in the order. So with the kind of ca conscious capitalism or um, sort of, you know, there are a lot of terms being used for it. I think there are allies. Um, you know, in Cleveland, Ohio, part of this strategy is being supported by one of the remaining large companies that are called Sherwin-Williams. It's a paint company. It's been there over 100 years. And we welcome the support. And I think there, there's certainly, uh, in my experience of a lot of the leaders of many, many companies these days, is they really feel uh, this thing is not working. <laughs> they know more than anybody. <laughs> they, they just don't know what to do. And they, like our communities, are trapped in a certain system. So I, I think there are tremendous allies we can draw upon. Uh, that said, I am also committed to a very different form of corporate ownership uh, that, you know, is much more localized and in different publics and so forth. Um, but I think there are, certainly in this period, this sort of interregnum, I think there can be a lot of allies in working together to achieve good results. Um, with the with, uh, banks, um, you know, again, it, one needs to be pragmatic. And, you know, is, so we're actually trying to not just have a theory, but actually make change now and benefit people. So with the um, uh, Evergreen Cooperatives, we went to a couple very large banks and negotiated not loans, because they won't loan, but something called, in the U.S., it's called New Markets Tax Credits. It's a financing mechanism that is intended to help build enterprise in lower-income urban core neighborhoods. We said the money's available. They don't get to, you know, call any shots with it. They don't get to be on the board. We'll partner with them in that. But again, 
I'm a big fan of local banking, and in the United States, there's one public bank. It's the Bank of North Dakota, very conservative state, started in the early 1900s when there was a very progressive movement in the western part of the United States. The Bank of North Dakota, during the Great Recession and the financial crisis, to a great extent, because that bank was there in North Dakota, it kept lending when credit everywhere else dried up. North Dakota ended up with one of the lower unemployment rates and one of the more robust economies at the time. And because of this, there are something like 30 states in the United States that are looking at establishing public banks so that the state government would capitalize with its own re, you know, reserves and dozens of city banks. So I think the more finance can be localized and accountable to the local community, the better. And then finally, with outsourcing, um, there, there are numerous studies, and I'd be happy if, if you want, I'll give you my card. Uh, at least they've been done in the United States that um, uh, show the limitations of the outsourcing, what happens to wages when this uh, takes place, um, even the environmental impacts, that um, there's much greater benefit uh, either to doing this work in-house, in a sense, rather than privatizing it all out, or partnering with the kinds of businesses that we've talked about here that are community-based, inclusive, locally rooted, and such. But I'd be happy to share some of the literature with you. Great. Let's take another bank of three questions. I'll take this gentleman here, this uh, lady here, and I'm going to take this gentleman here. And the snappier you make the questions, the more people we can fit in. Yeah. Um, surely the significant difference between what we might call traditional capitalism and the kind of cooperative capitalism that you've described is the decision about what happens to the profits. Because ultimately, if you have a democratic institution or local municipal um, organization, if there's a surplus made, where that surplus goes, either it's reinvested or issued as a dividend to the local workers, whereas in, the, in traditional capitalism, it's the shareholders who may be very distant people indeed, who get the profit and it's creamed out of the community. Exactly. That's the real distinction here, is about what happens to the profits. Thank you. Very good. My question is about education and whether any states in the United States <clears throat> have uh, explored this option. I know teachers, for example, are having to work two, three extra jobs, uh, you know, in a, in a profession that was previously seen as, you know, sustainable, particularly affects women um, and particularly single mothers. Um, yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And then it was this gentleman here. Thank you. Uh, you somehow are advocating for not having economies of scale and you're advocating that increasing the speed and increasing the network effect locally has an advantage. Is, is this a way to explaining to traditional people, yes, we are relatively inefficient Micro, mic, microeconomic way, but the network effect more than compensates that. Is, mm -hmm. is, that, a, is that a shortcut? Or, yeah. Thank you. Does Good. it make sense? Yeah. Good. So uh, very, um, very quickly, I think you're exactly right. <laughs> the bottom line issue here is w in, in a corporate structure, who gets to determine how the profits are allocated? And in, uh, you know, in, in a traditional corporation uh, owned by investors, um, you know, it's a very rational decision to maximize shareholder value. It may be short-sighted, but it's quite, uh, you know, quite rational. And indeed, if it appears that the company could produce more profit that could be allocated to the investors by moving somewhere else, that's a rational decision too. In the cooperative, locally rooted, um, the members are making uh, the decisions, and to become a member in a cooperative, you have to contribute your labor to it. So there are not outside investors, per se, in cooperatives, at least not the kind that can determine the direction of the company or the profits. Um, uh, so that um, uh, with education, uh, you know, it, it is, I'm a product of public education, what we call public education. I'm not sure it's the same term here, but you know, go to a high school, and, yeah. Um, uh, and I have got a fabulous education. Um, 
and it's just so distressing to see what has happened to education in the United States and has been systematically hollowed out and really starved of resources. Um, I do not know in, if there is a conversation in, in education and uh, you know, high schools and among teachers and professionals around this kind of cooperative model, but it's a really good, a really good question. And I think your point is, is a good one about this sort of network. Again, I, I, I'm not, for the purposes of the talk tonight, the emphasis was solely on local. We could have had another talk that maybe would be even better uh, by someone else on my staff uh, who would be talking about the large order scale changes. But I do think your point is a good one, that, that while these individual companies may be 50 people, so they're not General Motors or British Petroleum, um, you can start to get a network effect. And, and I think one place to see that and, and show the truth of it is looking at the Basque region of Spain and the Mondragon cooperatives there, which uh, very quickly in the 1950s, um, in the very poorest part of Spain that was being oppressed by General Franco, the dictator who survived World War II and lived into the seven, 1970s, um, the Basques, brought together, uh, it was a priest and four, five, I think five students who created their first little co-op to make little paraffin burning stoves. And they were a worker co-op and they all owned a piece of it. Fast forward 50 to 60 years later, from that humble beginning of five people, there are now something on the order of 75,000 people that work within the Mondragon cooperatives. It is an integrated network of more than 120 companies um, it produced revenues last year of, I believe, no, something north of 20 billion euros. Uh, they have the third largest bank in all of Spain, and they're the seventh largest industrial corporation. And some of the companies are fairly big, like 5,000 employees, but most of them are 30, 40, 20, 2. But they're networked together, and that's where they get their strength. So a final question for me, Ted. Um, if people are inspired by your ideas and, and analysis, and I hope that they are, what's the first move they should make potentially in their local communities to get going, to get things started, to start in small beginnings? Yeah, very good. Well, um, when I look at how things have begun, whether it's in Preston or in the United States, what has occurred is a small group of people who have done enough exploration of these ideas to understand them, have convened a, a, a gathering in their community to, in a sense, re-envision the economy of the local area. I was just the other night in one of your uh, communities here in London, in Hackney, and I was with Phil Glanville, who's the mayor of Hackney, and we brought together 60 people to talk about this kind of set of ideas and then take the next steps forward. Um, so, in a sense, having a community wealth roundtable to just envision and explore and then see who's interested in taking the next step. Then it could be a kind of inventory of how spending is leaking out of the community. There are a number of steps, and if anyone would like to know more, I'd be happy to give you my card and provide you templates and materials. As a, as a resident of Hackney, I feel like that was a hefty shove for getting involved myself. And, <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, I can see the mayor of Hackney still at the back, back, back of the room. So clearly, you are inspiring political leaders oh, across Newfield. across um, across of Europe. I hope I didn't say anything bad about you. <laughs> <laughs> a, a courageous local leader. <laughs> <laughs> well, so th thank you very much. And um, uh, I, I, should, I would highly recommend going on the Democracy Collaborative website and engaging with their material and the Next System project as well. I'd also recommend going on our website and downloading yes. ideas for a 21st century um, enlightenment um, because there's quite a lot of crossover with some of the things that have been um, outlined here mm -hmm. tonight. Um, I hope you'll all join us for a drink down in Rathmells after uh, the event and meet the RSA team, Ted um, and others. Um, but for now, um, do join me in giving a round of applause for an amazing speaker. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs>